morning. My name's Maureen Shell, and this is Sarah Allgaier. We're here today to talk about maple sugaring, which is one of our historically important activities and has been done here on the North American continent since before the pilgrims arrived. did maple sugaring and they all had different stories to explain how they figured out how to get maple from the tree because how would you figure out that you could take maple from a tree and make sugar it's not something that you would normally think of but each tribe or group has its own story this is my favorite it's from the Algonquin Indians and it is the story of Ininatig. Ininatig is an Algonquin word that means maple tree and man tree and the Native Americans called the maple tree the man tree because they shared a home with the maple tree. If you lived where the maple tree lived then animals that you hunted had enough shelter. You also were given shelter by the trees. There was good water there and there would always be food. So finding a place where you were sheltered by the maple tree was a good place to live. And so the Native Americans referred to it as Ininatig, the man tree. Well, this didn't always work. There were always bad years when you may not have had a good harvest, um, winter may have lasted, outlasted your food, and so finding food could be difficult. This is the story of such a year, and it was during the time of the hunger moon which traditionally comes at the end of February. And the reason it was called the Hunger Moon, why did we call it the Hunger Moon? Louder. Because they were hungry under it. They were hungry under it, very good, all right. So, this was the time of the Hunger Moon and there was a village that had run out of food. They had very little left and they didn't know what they were going to do. So they all got together and held a meeting and it was decided that the best thing to do would be for everyone to go in search of food. And they would go out in all directions, like the spokes of a wheel, away from the village. And everyone who was able to make the journey would walk at least two days, more if they could, to see if they could find sufficient food to bring back for the villagers. And so, everyone headed off. There was one family, a man, a woman, and their two children who walked away from the village for a day, two days. After two days, they still had not found a place that Father felt was a good place to stop for food. And so he said, we shall walk more. They walked another half a day, and all of a sudden Father stopped and said, look, this is a good spot. There are man trees here, and there are low plants flowering and seeding plants, and there is water nearby, we may find food here, so we will stop. So they stopped and they put down their burden bags and they made a spot. And Father said, here is what we shall do. Mother shall make ready the fire and get the cooking pots ready so that everyone will be able to cook whatever we find. And he said, you daughter will go hunting for dried berries and nuts in the low shrubbery and see what you can find that the birds and the animals have missed. And she said, yes, Father. And Father said to his son, you shall go and pull bark. Do we eat bark? Do you eat bark? Not often. Not often, but you do? No. Oh, I'll bet you do. Do you like cinnamon? Yes. Ah, did you know cinnamon is the bark of a tree? Aha! <laughs> great! Alright, and so the Indians didn't have cinnamon, but they did have other bark that they used to flavor their foods and to make drinks. One of these was shagbark hickory, and shagbark hickory makes kind of a lemonade flavor, lemonade tasting drink when you use the, when you use fresh bark in the spring, but it will season meat and other foods and it adds minerals and vitamins to the food. So brother went off to pull bark. And father said, I will dig for roots because this is the hardest job. And so off brother went that way, off sister went that way. Mother started to get the fire circle ready and she was going to go get water. But first she had to make a spot for the fire and lay the fire and go. 
covered things. She did this while they, while they were searching. And as Father knelt down near a tree to dig for roots, he heard something. It sounded like a voice that said, I can help. He looked over at his daughter and he said, did you say something, daughter? And she said, no, Father. So he went back to his work. He put the other knee down on the ground and he heard again, I can help. And he looked around and he said to his son, Son, did you say something? And his son said, No, Father, I'm working. And his father said, Well, that is strange. He said, Perhaps my stomach is talking to me because I am so hungry. And so Father went back to work. And as he started to dig, the voice came again, only this time it was louder and a little bit angry. And it said, If you would but listen, I can help. And Father straightened up and said, who are you that you I should listen to you? And the voice said, I am in an attic. And father stopped and he stood up and he said, oh, he said, if you will wait a moment, I will gather my family so that we can all hear what you have to say. And he called his family around and said, the Anatik speaks and we must listen. And so everyone listened and the Anatik said, I will help you to find a fine food that will help you to survive the hunger you must do exactly as I say. And Father said, we will, we will honor that request. And Inanatik said, if you will take your knife and make a cut in the tree, like two rivers becoming one, and then put your wooden bowls at the base of the one river, as soon as you make this cut, water will flow from my skin. Collect that water and use it to cook whatever foods you have and you may find and it will thicken and get dark. And when it does, it will be a fine food that will help you to survive. And so they agreed to do as Inanatik had said. And mother went to get the bowls and father made the cuts in the tree. And the water flowed into the bowls and mother carried water back and forth between the cooking pots and the tree while everyone gathered what they had and they got out what little food they had brought with them. And they filled the cooking pots and they filled the cooking pots with the, with the water from the tree, for it was like water. And then they cooked. And after a little while, it started to smell really fine. And they were so hungry. And they begged mother, can we try it, can we try it? And she said, no, it is not thick and dark yet. We must do as the tree said. So we'll let it keep cooking until it's finished. And so they did. And she stirred, and she stirred, and she stirred, and they were, oh, their stomachs were just talking. They were so hungry. And when at last Mother lifted the spoon and the dark, thick water dripped off very slowly, she said, I think it is done. And they tried it, and oh, it was so delicious. They emptied the whole cooking pot and reached for another, and Mother said, no. We must take what is left back to help feed those who are hungry in the village and explain to them how this works. For Inanatig also lives near our village. And so they did this. They, they wrapped up the cooking pots and, and packed their burden bags and got everything ready to go. And they, they spread the ashes and made everything as it was. And then they had one more thing to do before they left. What do you think? louder. Thank him. Thank the tree. So they all went to speak to Inanatik and father said, we have come to thank you for the gift of sweet water. It is a wonderful gift. And Inanatik said, as long as you take it only during the time of the hunger moon, you may use what you need. But if you, if you go past the time of the hunger moon, I need this water to live and I will not be able to survive well if you do not stop. And they agreed that they would take the sweet water only during the time of the hunger moon. And to this day, we honor that promise and take the sweet water from the maple tree only during the time of the hunger moon. So what do you think? Do you think that the tree really talked to them? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe there's more ways to listen to the tree than just ears. I think maybe they saw the tree speaking because 
there were ways for them to look and see what was happening with the tree. And they were so used to living in nature and using what nature offered them that they saw things that we often don't see, like this. This is a picture of sapsicles. Can you get it without a glare? Okay, this is a picture of sapsicles. These grew on a maple tree that had broken branches from a heavy winter storm. And then when the sap started to rise in the tree in the spring, it dripped out these breaks and created sapsicles. The animals love the sapsicles. They fight over them. We have seen deer jump six feet in the air to try and get hold of a sapsicle. And so do you think maybe the Indians saw that happening? I think they may have. And they decided that maybe they should try the sapsicles. And maybe they decided if they put them in their cooking pots and melted them, they wouldn't have to go so far to carry water. And that's something that we think may have helped them to learn. Another thing that scientists believe, anthropologists believe, may have helped them to learn is this. This is an acorn woodpecker. And it drills holes all over the tree and stuffs them with nuts. And during the winter, it goes back and eats the nuts. But in the spring, do you know what happens with those holes? The sap drips right out and down, and the animals come to get the sap. And I'm sure the Indians saw this happen. Don't you think? I do too. I think that's probably exactly what happened. So, they knew that they could use the sweet water to make a good food, and they did make a good food. They used different tools to make that food than we do, but they got very, very good at it. The Indians called it Zinzi Bakwat, and this is also an Algonquin word that means drawn from the wood. And so that is what they called the maple syrup. And they built camps where the maple trees were to make syrup. They used tools made of bark and wood, small cones, and they used hollowed out bowls to collect the sap, like this. The sap looks like water. It's only 2% sugar, but that's 1 and 3 fourths percent more sugar than most other sap in other trees. So they have a very high sugar content. And the Indians developed many ways to do this. They also, at first, after making the Y cuts in the trees, they discovered that if they took mulberry branches that have a very soft pith, they could make spouts to put into the side of the tree and just make a small hole in the tree. And then, instead of losing some of the water that ran down the side of the tree, all of the water would go into their bowls. And so they started doing this. These are mulberry spouts, and they would be used with hollowed out bowls. Now their bowls would be larger, so the whole sections of log would be hollowed out. But we don't, of course, we can't carry that around. And they didn't carry it around either. They would turn them back over and leave them there for the next year. So this is our trade blanket. The Indians would have traveled with a blanket like this from very early on after the traders started coming into the into the um, northwest Ohio area, into the Ohio country. And the traders brought blankets and the Indians wanted those blankets because they could wear them as coats. They could use them as bed rolls. They could roll them up and sit on them. They lined their shoes with the wool. They made clothing out of the wool because wool does something magic. Wool is warm even when it's wet. And so for the Indians, this made it a magic fabric, and they wanted as much of it as they could. They would take old wool apart and reweave it to make new things, like this belt. And so before that time, they wore mostly deer skins, elk skins, moose skins, and these were tanned. This is brain tanned leather, like the Indians wore. It's very, very soft. Would you, would you want to wear that? It's very, very soft. And still highly sought after and very expensive today. Every deer's brain contains just enough to tan its hide. And so the Indians had learned this, and they made very soft, flexible, warm leather 
that they could wear. But once it's wet, it's cold. And so the wool gave them a wonderful option for clothing. Another thing that the Indians were able to do after the traders came was the traders wanted beaver skins mostly, but other skins as well, like our raccoon. And the Indians wanted things that the traders had. The Indians did not know how to work metal, so they wanted metal blades. And this made it easier for them to do their work. Before that, they used stone or bone blades. This is a stone axe head. And it is a, it's an actual Indian axe head that was found here in Northwest Ohio. And it's probably 300 or 400 years old. All right, this is a stone axe that was actually found in Northwest Ohio. It's probably three to 400 years old. Um, and so you can see that it was shaped so that it would fit in the hand. It could be used by hand or it could, be, it could have a branch wrapped around it and used as a long-handled axe for chopping trees or for breaking stones. So this, is a, this was a, a great deal of work to smooth this out like this. And so when the trappers came with their blades, the Native Americans wanted the blades. And the trappers traded them for blades. And they would carry their tomahawk heads in a leather bag with the blade up and then when they got to where they were going to make camp, they would cut themselves a handle. That way they didn't have to carry the, they didn't have to carry the blade precariously hooked into their belt, like you see on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing that the Indians really wanted from the trappers was kettles, cooking equipment. The Indians had been using bark bowls, wooden bowls, clay pots for cooking. They didn't know how to work metal. And so for them, this was amazing. They could save so much time cooking. They could cook so much more in this. This is a, this is the size kettle the Indians wanted. And the reason they wanted this size kettle is that they could tie it on their back and carry it with them packed with food goods when they were traveling because mostly they traveled on foot. Ameri Indians in the northwest in the in the northwest Ohio did not have horses. Horses were not common in this part of the country as wild animals. When the trappers and traders came and the settlers started to come, then the Indians started to have horses. But before that, they went everywhere on foot. And so having these made life much, much easier for the Indians. And you can see that this is a hand hammered kettle. You can tell by looking at the finish on the kettle. You can tell by looking at the handle that it was made by a blacksmith. And it's a very, it's a very nice brass kettle with copper rivets and a steel handle. So this was used for sugaring also after the Indians were able to get these. But before that, they did their sugaring in hollowed out trees. They would heat stones, which they traded for basalt rocks from up around Lake Superior. Basalt is volcanic stone and can be heated to a very high temperature without cracking or breaking. And so when they would leave their sugar camps, they would actually bury their stones and their, and their other utensils near a marked tree. And then when they came back the following year, they would dig them up and use them again. So the stones were a trade item. Our Indians traded Ohio flint for basalt rock. And our flint was the best in the country for fire making. And so it came from down between Lima and Wapakoneta and where the Flint Ridge is in Ohio. And it was very fine flint. And, and in, it was so important to have this flint that the Indians had a treaty that when you went to dig flint, you marked a tree, and as long as you had marked a tree, no one could quarrel with you. And so all disagreements were put aside when you went to the Flint Ridge to mine flint. So that was very, very important. Now when the settlers came, probably at the first Thanksgiving, if there was any sugar at all, it would have been maple. Because by that time, the pilgrims had used up all of, the, all of the stores they had brought with them. And all they had to eat was what the Indians had taught them to eat. And so the only sugar that would have been there would have been maple sugar. There would have been no pumpkin pies. 
<laughs> Nothing sweet. It would have all been, if it was sweet, it would have been seasoned with maple sugar. Now, the Indians did not make syrup. They had no way to keep it. Where do you keep your maple syrup? Bottle. <laughs> and where do you keep that bottle? In the fridge. In the refrigerator. <laughs> That's right. But the Indians didn't have refrigeration. So for them, they made what we call sugar cake. And it, and they cooked the sugar pat they cooked the syrup past so that it started to granulate in the kettle and become hard. And they would pack it into flat bowls or small gourd bowls that had been cut off like this and make flat cakes. This is a this is a cake that was made last year at a sugar bush. So it was made in a, in a small square pan. But the Indians made them in bark bowls or in or in gourd bowls. And then they would have that hard sugar. As long as it was kept dry, it would keep forever. Literally forever. And it's hard. And I cannot break it with my hand. It's too hard. You can't break it with your teeth. But the Indians would break, would carry this with them in their pouches when they traveled as a quick energy food and as something that they could cook their meat with. And it added flavor. And it also has um, vitamins and minerals in it that were important to the diet. And it's a natural sugar, so the body uses it more efficiently than our processed sugars that we use today. And so it's it's really a very good product that we even should probably be using today. And at our house we do. Don't we? So this is what the Indians made. That's why we call it maple sugaring to this day. Because to them, they didn't make syrup, they made sugar. And they kept it all year round. They used it for trade. They traded it for things like these trade beads. Now these are actual trade beads that came over on a ship from Europe during the time of settlement. And they were so cheap that they were actually, barrels were filled with them and they were used as ballast on ships. And if there was too much weight on a ship, they could throw one of these barrels overboard and it didn't cost them hardly anything. That's what they were trading to the Indians. They're beautiful and they're still made today in countries like Czechoslovakia in some of the same factories that existed at that time. But they were very, very cheap back then. And so the Indians did not realize that they actually were being cheated. But now today, these are expensive. These were raised from the floor of, of one of the ports on the East Coast, where they bring up the barrels full and clean them, and now we can buy them today. And so this strand cost me about $36. And, uh, that's, that wasn't a bad price for these. But back in the day, they, it would have, they would have been worth pence, not, not even a penny. So um, the Indians made their own money at that time. This is wampum. This was made out of a shell called quahog, which is a freshwater mussel that is found all throughout the Great Lakes and in most of our rivers between here and the East Coast. And so, but these all had to be hand drilled and it took a very long time. The cord is birch cord that was hand woven from the underside of bark from the birch tree. And so this is a this is an arm piece made of wampum. And so this is this is shell wampum. This was made on a machine. To buy the handmade wampum today, it costs about seven dollars a bead. So and rightly so, it's a lot of work. So all right. Anything else that we need to? Did we forget anything? No. Is there the basket? Oh, this is a this is a pack basket. The traders carried these, and you can you can carry a lot of fur in a pack basket. Um, this is a coyote. This is a, a raccoon, and this is the most this is the most important fur. The beaver. Um, the beaver was the fur that the settlers that the trappers wanted the most. It was worth the most. Um, the Indians were, were proficient hunters, and so they would trade furs to the trappers. And these were sent back to Europe to be used to make all manner of things. Um, President Lincoln had a beaver hat. Um, one of his beaver hats is at the um, 
Henry Ford Museum in the in the display of his chair from Ford Theater. Um, this was not used as a fur. The hair was used. It was scraped off of the skins and processed in huge vats. It was cooked in huge vats with glue. And then it was rolled out on great big tables, 12 feet wide by 24 feet long, and rolled with metal rollers like we roll our grass with today, until it was flat and all stuck together. And then it was allowed to dry. This made a fabric called felt. And this was used to make hats, seat covers for handsome cabs where the driver sat outside. Um, coats like Sherlock Holmes double cape, the top cape would have been be would have been beaver felt because it was waterproof. And that's why this was so sought after in Europe and it was very, very popular and worth a great deal to the traders. And they carried these pack baskets and the Indians used things in different ways than we do. They carried small leather bags and things. They wore leather as clothing, but they didn't make large containers out of leather. They used, they used splints. And so the traders who were often living with the Indians because it was safer for them, um, they would hire baskets made or they would learn to make their own baskets. And the pack baskets were very, very popular. They were also carried by soldiers at this time. And this is a they and they came in three different sizes. If you if you were issued these as a soldier, they came in three different sizes. This is a medium size. I actually have a larger one than this. It stands about this tall. And then there was a smaller one also. So that you would have the one that was best for, for your needs. And baskets were a very, very important part. Gourd bowls and baskets were what most things were stored in in the Native American homes. So and they could hang the baskets in the longhouses so that small animals and things couldn't get into their food stores. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you, Maureen. Oh, you're